Chapter 51 Visitors The End of His Public Labor His Last Passover The Breaking of Bread Having concluded his discourse to the disciples as they sat on the Mount of Olives, Jesus went to Bethany for the night, returning early next day to the temple. It only lacked a few days to that Passover of which he was to partake for the last time under the law of Moses, a feast to be resumed in another more glorious time. Many were assembling to the feast, and the city was full of people. Jesus took advantage of the opportunity of teaching those who came to the temple courts. He did this in the daytime, always retiring at night to Bethany. He was now known more or less to all who were in the habit of attending the feast. But on the occasion of this feast, there was a special band of Greek Jewish visitors who had heard of him and had probably never seen him and were desirous of an introduction to him with which view they applied to Philip of Bethsaida, who, they had ascertained, was one of his disciples. Philip reported their desire to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip go together to tell Jesus. From the way that Jesus received the intimation, we may infer that the proposed interviewers were more animated by curiosity than by any earnestness of purpose towards Christ. Perhaps, like a good many people in modern times, They had a little earnestness, mixed up with a good deal of personal consequence, and were desirous of approaching Christ with the idea that, if he were the Messiah, their adhesion might be of some help to him, while of great advantage to themselves. Whatever may have been their mood, and it is of course possible that, in these suggestions, we may wrong them, Jesus did not give them the cordial reception which Nathanael received at his hand when he came to him inquiringly, over three years earlier. He does not appear to have received them at all. He made remarks of a standoff character and departed and did hide himself from the multitude. The remarks he made appear quite irrelevant to the communication made to him unless we look deep enough. First of all, he said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. This might seem to mean that he regarded the respectful inquiries of these Greek visitors as the beginning of a current of popular favor, the shallow school of opinion that would bring Christ down to the level of a human enthusiast would put this interpretation upon it. It is impossible that such an interpretation can be correct in view of his refusal of the movement to make him a king. It is inconceivable that he who refused the homage of a multitude should be moved to compliance by the private attentions of a few. Neither is it conceivable that he who wept over Jerusalem in the midst of a public ovation because he foresaw the troubles coming upon her for her refusal of divine ways should be so gratified with the complimentary inquiries of a few foreign visitors as to talk of his being glorified thereby. His very next remark utterly excludes the thought. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This shows it was death, and not public acceptance, that he was looking to for the glorification that was before his mind. His death only, followed by resurrection, would open the way for the fecundity that would fill the earth with life and glory. This death was only a few days ahead. What could it matter to him that a few influential Greek Jews were curious about him? His glory would not come from mortal attention, but from his own submission to the Father, who had required him to lay down his life. He goes further and hints that the rule was a severe one by which men could become associated with his glory. It was evidently far from what the influential visitors were thinking. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. The visitors had probably no idea of hating their life in this world, but much the reverse, in wishing a connection with one 
who might be the Messiah. The way was open for them, nevertheless, if they chose to submit to the terms. If any man serve me, let him follow me, that where I am, there also shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. This was on the whole a rebuff to the visitors. Following Christ in the keeping of his self-denying commandments and looking to the Father for any honor that might come of such a course was the reverse of an attractive program to men who were looking to present advantage and expecting in case of their adhesion to Christ some distinguished and grateful consideration at his hands. We read a few verses further on that many among the chief rulers believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus was far from seeking to conciliate human favor. He went on to say, Now is my soul troubled. Certainly the prospect of his sufferings troubled him, as he told his disciples before. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? That would have been a merely human prayer, the prayer of mere human distress. It was not a prayer he could pray, seeing he had been manifested for the very purpose of the hour. For this cause came I unto this hour. What was a legitimate prayer for such a time then? Father, glorify thy name. At this the Father audibly spoke. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This is the universal rule of well-being, past, present, and to come. The earth will not be blessed till the earth is filled with his glory. Man cannot be happy unless he lives to glorify God. All things else have their place, but this is the top stone of existence. The people heard the sound of the voice of God, but to Jesus only the words appear to have been articulate and intelligible. The people said that it thundered. Jesus answered, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. That is, Jesus required not such a response to determine him in the course he was to pursue. The people required it, that they might believe on him. God gave them all the evidence that could be necessary. He left them without excuse. For himself, Jesus knew that rejection and death were at hand, and it was all he had to look for at their hands. But there was a purpose in it. Therefore, he could face it. It was not in caprice or without a most serious object that the Father required the Son to submit to ignominy and a cruel death at the hands of the very people he had come to save. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. His death would compass both these things spoken in parable. It would condemn the world, it would cast out the prince of it, and it would give Christ as the dawning point of the world's hope and futurity. How it would accomplish these things, the subsequent explanations of the apostles show. In the crucifixion of Christ, sin was condemned in the flesh. This is the general declaration of the Spirit of God, whose significance becomes apparent on a full view of all the facts it comprehends. We first look at the world, whether in its mosaic or Gentile element, and we see that it consisted wholly of the flesh and blood of Adam, who sinned, and thereby became subject to death. The prince of this world we may take to mean the government of this world, which is a government of the world by itself, personified as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. God had, in various ways, since Adam's expulsion from Eden, 
employed the world of Adam's descendants in the work of organizing and conducting human life upon the earth, but nothing satisfactory had come of it. In the first phase of things, a flood was necessary to sweep away the corrupt population. In the succeeding era, the seven nations of Canaan required extermination at the hands of Joshua. In the Mosaic system, God's own nation required repeated captivity and spoil to keep them in the right way, and they, at last, went wholly astray. In the days of Jesus, the measure of Israel's iniquity was full, and there impended a visitation of judgment of unprecedented severity and duration. In Jesus himself, the foundation stone of a new order of things was being laid, as saith the prophet, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The first step in the process was the begettal of the Son of Mary by the Spirit, the second, his growth and development in the ways of his Father, the third, his manifestation to Israel in the word and works of God. And now was about to be accomplished the next and most difficult of all, so far as Christ's submission was concerned, the public and official condemnation of sin in his crucifixion, which his nature qualified him to be the subject of, but not without all the suffering of the most sensitive of Adam's race. His physical flesh and blood, as he was before his death, was identical with that which had prevailed upon earth from Adam downwards, characterized by the same weakness and mortality, arising from the same hereditary cause, the sentence of death upon Adam. The nailing of his body to the cross was therefore a representative ritual, in which the rejection of the first Adam, nature, was signified, and the righteousness of God thereby declared. As Paul affirms in Romans, it was a declaration of the righteousness of God for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. We morally identify ourselves with the transaction when we receive it in faith as God's appointed mode of reconciliation. Paul expresses it thus, Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The next step in the process of laying the foundation stone was Christ's resurrection to immortal life. With this, the old Adam nature had nothing to do. Death was the part appertaining to the old Adam. In that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. His resurrection to immortal life was the result of obedience, and that obedience was the result of the new work which God did upon the earth in his love, when he begat a son for himself, who should live and die and live again, that the world might be saved in harmony with all the requirements of eternal wisdom. Therefore, the whole work was God's work. Of God he is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. And by these he is our life. For because of these he who raised Christ from the dead shall raise us up also by Jesus. Jesus understood all these things, though he reserved their full explanation till afterwards. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, this due time arrived when the apostles were sent forth by the Spirit to proclaim that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that through this man was preached the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believed were justified. But though the full explanation was reserved for the apostles, we have seen that Jesus repeatedly referred in the course of his public teaching to the place which his death had in the scheme of God's love for the salvation of the world. 
His death was the germinal casting out of the old, His resurrection, the bringing in of the new. The full result will not be manifest till the work accomplished in Himself will be extended and established in a race of sinless immortals, before whom the present population will have disappeared in relentless extermination. But it was begun within a few days of the utterance of the words we are now considering. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John says, This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people seemed to understand that his words meant this, for they answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth for ever. And how sayest thou, The Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? The time was not suitable for a lengthened rejoinder. Their mood was unbelieving. Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. What could be done with men who were proof against such evidence? Jesus therefore briefly replied, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have light, lest darkness come upon you. A few more days, and the light ceased, and the nation stumbled on for thirty years or more in the darkness of rabbinical tradition, till, in the words of the prophet, Hell opened her mouth, and their glory and honor and pomp descended into it. The Roman perdition swept the land, and nigh consumed the obstinate nation off the face of the earth. A few finishing words concluded the testimony which Jesus had for three years and a half been engaged in delivering. In these farewell words, he accommodated himself for a moment to their point of view. He realized that they stumbled at his personal appearance, as Isaiah had foretold, Their conceptions of messianic grandeur and power made them stagger at the unpretentious personality of a lowly carpenter of Nazareth. He therefore cried and said, as if earnestly protesting the truth to them for the last time, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me as much as to say, I am nothing in myself. Do not be repelled because you see no beauty to desire in me. It is the God of your fathers who begat me and dwells in me that presents himself to you for your good. It is him you see in seeing me. It is on him you believe when you believe on me. Understood in this way, he pressed himself earnestly upon their attention. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. At the same time, he wished them to understand it was no part of his mission at that time to employ coercion. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, not at that time, but to save the world that is, to open the way of salvation and point it out to them, and earnestly plead with them to walk in it. If they refuse submission, the loss would be all their own. At the same time, there would be judgment in due course. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. Why his words would be the rule of judgment he makes plain to the meanest capacity. For I have not spoken of myself, that is, of my own impulse or authority, but the Father who sent me. He gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. If the words of Christ are the words of God, Is it wonderful that they should be the rule of judgment hereafter? Men, strong in each other's countenance, 
treat them lightly now. How changed will their attitude be when he is present in the earth again to apply the teaching which they are privileged to have in their hand now in his absence? And here a curtain drops upon his public labors. His next appearance was before the council as a prisoner. Between the one point and the other, there probably did not elapse more than three days. And it was during this interval that those wonderful communications passed between Jesus and the apostles, which find record in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters of John. Private, fraternal, affectionate communications in which Jesus, without abating the dignity of the Master, unbosomed himself as he did on no other recorded occasion as a friend. There appears to have been two occasions on which these communications passed, one being before the feast of the Passover, in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, and the other, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. To the first of these belonged the washing of the disciples' feet, though at first sight it appears as if it occurred on the second. The appearance is due to the word supper in John 13, verse 1, which is usually confounded with the Lord's Supper. It is evident it was a supper at Bethany. At the end of it, Jesus rose from his place, put off his upper robe, and to the surprise of his disciples, took a towel and girded himself, poured water into a basin, and began to wash their feet one by one, drying them with the towel which he had tied around him. They submitted in quiet amazement till it came to Peter's turn. Peter could not endure such humiliation of his Lord. Wash my feet? Never. If I wash thee not... Thou hast no part with me, no part with Christ. This was more unendurable still. Peter was ready for anything rather than this, at least he thought so. We never know ourselves until we are in circumstances that throw us fully upon our own resources. He implored Christ to wash his head and hands as well, if it was a question of association with him. But Christ gently gave him to understand it was not necessary. So Peter suffered the washing of his feet, and Christ, rearraying himself in his garments, sat down again in his place. He then explained what he had done. Could friend humble himself more completely to friend than in such an act? It was not a mystic ceremony he had gone through, though having a meaning special to his own recognition. It was an act of personal ministration, and in the most menial form. Peter appreciated it in this character, and rebelled against it, as we have seen. It was the practical lowliness that Jesus intended. He had told his disciples early in his communications with them that a man must humble himself as a little child to be eligible for the kingdom. He was now about to leave them, and he wished to leave a deep impression on this point. Could he have possibly done it more effectually? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I, then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. There are those that make this feet-washing an institution to be ceremonially observed along with the breaking of bread, and it is part of the ritual of the Roman Catholic Church at a certain season to enact it as a performance. This view is unsupported by apostolic example as exhibited in the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. The only allusion to feet-washing is in the list of private excellencies on the part of a widow, requiring support in her old age. It is evident that Christ contemplated nothing beyond the inculcation of humble, kindly, mutual, practical, personal ministration of which he chose feet-washing as the extremest form in a country where the wearing of sandals 
exposed the feet to dust and irritation, and rendered the washing of the feet a personal luxury. That Jesus should enforce personal humility and lowliness on the future kings of the world is one of the numberless beauties of the purpose of God which can center in him. What a noble race of kings and priests the saints will be when chosen for their faith and obedience out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and invested with the glory of the spirit nature. The Passover feast furnished the other occasion. The time for this feast had come. It was part of the duty of Jesus, obedient in all things, to keep the Passover as part of the law under which he was born. On this occasion, he was impelled by special desire, as he told the disciples at the commencement of the proceedings. With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He gave them two days' notice beforehand. It was the killing of the other Passover that was before the mind of Christ, evidently. Thus he said, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. John says, Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. No wonder he should dwell on a Passover so momentous for him, and of such significance for the Passover itself, which, in his own death, should have its full meaning and entire supersession for eighteen centuries. The disciples had not yet reached the meanings of things in this respect. The kingdom filled their eye, and their affection for Christ as its living, noble, miracle-working king. They were about to be enlightened by a very rude process. The first day of the feast arrived, the fourteenth day of the month Abib, in the evening of which the Passover must be killed. Jesus had not indicated where he would observe the feast with them. There was no time to lose. They inquired of Jesus, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? While Jesus and the disciples were making their arrangements, very different arrangements were being made at the palace of Caiaphas the high priest, a large and stately building in Jerusalem. A general meeting of the priesthood and heads of the people had been convened in this building under that official's auspices to consult as to the best means of getting Christ into their power. They were burning with unappeasable anger under the wounds inflicted upon their pride and self-love in their collisions with him, and especially by his open denunciation of them before all the people. They were resolved upon his destruction, but they did not see exactly how to bring it about. They had power to impeach him to the Roman governor Pilate, if they could get hold of him. But there was a great difficulty as to this, on account of the friendly feelings entertained for Jesus by the common people. If they made an attempt to arrest him in the presence of the people, there was danger of a resistance that might be formidable to the chief priests themselves. Yet they knew not how to get at him in the absence of the people, for he was only a visitor to Jerusalem, and his haunts were not known outside the circle of his friends, who were also unknown. It was only among the people that he was to be found, and among them he could not be taken because of the attention they gave him. There was considerable discussion, but no decisive result beyond a general agreement that there must be no attempt on the feast day when the crowds of people would be thronging the temple courts, that they must be on the outlook and trust to tact and craft to get Jesus into their power. What measures they resolved on with this view we are not informed, but it is probable they gave it to be understood that there was money to be made by those who might be willing to aid them in their schemes. How far they would have succeeded if there had not been a Judas among the disciples is very problematical, but their success was appointed, and the instrument was at hand. Judas heard of their plotting, and the idea occurred to him that he might turn it to his own advantage. Avarice, which was a normal weakness with him, took fire at the idea. In Bible language, Satan entered into him. Instead of dismissing the thought, 
with a determination with which he would have flung a deadly serpent from himself. He turned it over. He considered it. He entertained it. Perhaps there may be something in the suggestion that has been made, that he took comfort in the idea that Christ was able to deliver himself from their power, and that no harm could come from Judas making money by what could bring no hurt to Christ. At all events, he went straight to the chief priests and plumply said, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you, in the absence of the multitude. The proposal filled the chief priests with supremest satisfaction. It was the very thing. It released them from a great dilemma and relieved them with splendid promise of gratifying the feelings that burned in their bosoms against Jesus without exposing themselves to the violence of the crowd. They were glad and covenanted to give him money. And from that moment, Judas sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. That opportunity he found and embraced by and by. Jesus, with a full knowledge of all that was going on and of all that was coming upon him, gave directions to his disciples to make arrangements which were equivalent to getting ready a death trap for him. They were to engage an apartment in the city and get ready the Passover in preparation for their celebration of the same in the evening. The engagement of a place, which, being put off to the last moment, would have been a difficulty in ordinary circumstances in the crowded state of the city, proved a very simple matter in the hands of such a master of the ceremonies. Peter and John were to go into the city and would meet a man carrying water. They were to follow this man till they saw him go into a house. They were then to go in after him and deliver a message from Christ to the master of the house. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And he would show them a large upper room furnished, of which they would at once take possession and proceed to make the necessary preparations. They went, and everything happened as Christ had said. What is impossible to such foreknowledge except the disobedience of the Father's commandments? The master of the house was probably acquainted with Christ and friendly to him, and he had probably been restrained from letting his place to other Passover visitors. When God wants a man or a thing, there will be provision. At the hour appointed, Jesus and his disciples assembled in the guest chamber and sat down to eat the Passover. The nature of the repast, roast lamb, unleavened bread and wine, and the occasion of it, the celebration of the anniversary of Israel's departure from Egypt under Moses on the night of the slaying of the Egyptian firstborn, are well known. It is not these that challenge our attention as we look upon this quiet company of thirteen men. Doubtless the order of procedure would be observed that was customary with a company of Jews assembled for such a purpose. But there was more than one thing done on this occasion that was never done before, and such things said as had never before been uttered in any company, Jew or Gentile. The whole complexion of the meeting, in fact, differed from any previous assembly for the eating of the Passover. Not gladness, but sadness prevailed. And this sadness was at first concentrated in the head of the company, whose first remark struck a heavy keynote. With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. These words were simple enough. Yet were they not intelligible to the disciples till afterwards, and could only have a sort of scaring effect. That he was about to suffer, they could not realize in the presence of his great power. That they would never celebrate the Passover with him again must have been inconceivable to men who thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Still, his words filled them with sorrow, as Jesus afterwards recognized. The effect was not abated when he introduced a feature 
that was never in the program at the eating of the Passover before. As they were eating, he took bread, the bread that was on the table for Passover purposes, and gave thanks, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of the sins of many. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The full meaning of these words the disciples apprehended afterwards through the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit sent upon them on the day of Pentecost as an instructor, and they were able to discern the will of Christ that this simple ceremony of the breaking of bread was to be observed once a week by all his disciples during his absence until he come. But for the time, the words which were calculated to soothe and which have, in fact, since ministered comfort to millions of disciples, convened to break bread in remembrance of Christ, must have only added to the gloom caused by his opening words. Chapter 52 At the Table Jesus began to indicate the cloud he was under, from his knowledge of the impending treachery of Judas. He had spoken of their blessedness, if they continued in his commandments. He now said, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Then a pause, in symptoms that he was troubled in spirit. Then plainer language. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. We can imagine the consternation that this announcement would produce. The disciples looked one upon another, doubting of whom he spake. One asked, Lord, is it I? And another, Lord, is it I? The Lord answered vaguely, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Several did this all more or less, therefore it was no indication. Peter beckoned to John to ask in a particular manner, as he sat next to Christ and was on terms of particular intimacy and affection. John then, lying on Jesus' breast, probably laying his head there for the purpose of this confidence, whispered, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Upon which, he dipped the sop and handed it to Judas. Judas appears at this point to have asked like the rest, Lord, is it I? And to have received an affirmative answer, Thou hast said, but probably the excited communications passing among the disciples prevented the question and answer from being observed. For when Jesus said to him on his rising to go, What thou doest, do quickly, it is said that none of them knew what Jesus meant by this, but supposed it referred to some business arrangement connected with the feast. The departure of Judas happened immediately after the mark of identification granted at John's request. That Jesus should wish him to do his fell work quickly is an interesting sidelight. It shows us the Lord's state of mind with regard to the terrible trouble before him. Jesus was under a great embarrassment till his sacrifice should be accomplished. He endured and went through it with heroic fortitude. This all can admire, but how it adds to his lovableness in the eyes of his people that he was not a stoic in the matter, but felt as human nature everywhere feels at the prospect of suffering, going through it, not with callous indifference, but with the resolution inspired by
by a recognition of the Father's will and an understanding of the must-be there was in the case. Jesus appears to have felt relieved when Judas had withdrawn. When he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And he proceeds with those confidential communications which are recorded so fully in John's Gospel. It seems strange at first sight that there should have been a traitor among the apostles who were all chosen by Christ himself at the beginning. Did he make a mistake in choosing Judas? Impossible. Did he not know him? He knew him well. He needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Why, then, did he choose a man who would play false at the last? There were doubtless reasons of which no indication has been given, but we may note the value to subsequent generations in the occurrence of such a breach in the circle closest to Christ, in that it shows us the impossibility of the apostolic narrative being a concoction, for who would make one of the apostles a traitor if the story had been an invention? and arms believers against undue discouragement at any unfaithfulness that may spring up in their ranks. For if a personal attendant of Christ and a witness of his miracles could be false to a trust directly imposed by him, what is not possible in the weak days of mere testimony by report? The disciples do not appear to have taken greatly to heart the intimation that one of them would betray him. They understood it enough to join in an earnest repudiation of such an idea, but not enough to realize that it was an actual impending catastrophe. So little affected were they by it in this sense, that when the immediate sensation caused by it had subsided, they began to discuss among themselves the positions they were severally likely to have in the kingdom, which they thought was about to be established, a discussion not the most dignified as regards the spirit leading to it. It was a spirit of emulation, an uncircumcised, short-sighted, petty spirit. There was actually a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. So little yet did they know the manner of spirit belonging to the mighty matter to which they had been called. How greatly must this deficiency of theirs have aggravated the Lord's trouble, to think that his very own disciples, in the very crisis of his approaching agony, should be debating a question such as should never be raised among saints at any time. In his greatness, he was able to excuse them. They were not yet what they would be by and by, and what they became when the Spirit gave them understanding and their strife was only the misappreciation of a real matter to which they stood related, a position of authority with him in the kingdom that would surely come. So he gently chode them and instructed them. The kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. On this basis he confirmed their ideas on the kingdom, and their expected participation therein as the companions of his labor. Ye are they that have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he returns to the question of the betrayal. Addressing himself to Peter, who had probably been prominent in the discussion of the question of personal precedence, he exclaims, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, plural, and to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. 
And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Christ probably meant that the authorities who were plotting his destruction would try to corrupt the fidelity of the disciples one by one should Judas fail them, and that Peter would be in special danger from such a process, in more danger than the others it would seem, for he prayed specially for Peter that the temptation might not be too much for him. That Peter was weak was shown in his denial of Christ at the last moment. Was Christ's prayer on his behalf of no avail then? We are in every way debarred from coming to such a conclusion. Peter did not prove the traitor which he might have done. And when he stumbled into a momentary denial, he stumbled out as quickly and washed away his guilt in tears. His faith did not fail him as it might have done had the Lord not prayed for him. It may seem strange that Peter, the impulsive, the weak, and by the Lord's denial, the dishonored, should have been afterwards chosen as the Spirit's mouthpiece on the day of Pentecost, and employed in the specially honorable office of holder and user of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, in opening the doors thereof officially and finally for Jew and Gentile, first for the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and afterwards for the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. Why not John, the loving and the loyal? Why not James, the faithful and stern? Why Peter, the weak and the disgraced? Because flesh and blood at its best is liable to appropriate the glory that belongs to God, like Moses at the waters of Meribah, for which he was excluded from the land of promise. Peter, the humbled, humbled in his own eyes, humbled by himself, was not in so much danger. He would always remember the shame of having publicly denied the Lord. He would always feel like Paul after him, that he was not worthy to be called an apostle. He was therefore qualified to fill the highest station in the ministration of the Spirit without being lifted up, for which his undoubted affectionate loyalty fitted him on another side of his character. When Judas had departed, Jesus appears to have drawn closer to the disciples. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go ye cannot come, so now I say to you. Jesus was referring to his approaching departure by ascension after resurrection. The disciples did not understand. Peter, always forward as the spokesman of the rest, asked, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus did not answer directly. The going in the case included shame, rejection, and death, as well as ascension. In these the apostles would follow him afterwards, as he now said to Peter, Thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter protested he was willing to follow to the laying down of his life. So Peter felt at the moment, and such really was his disposition at the bottom of his heart, for he did at the last submit to death for Christ's sake. But he was not so strong at this time as he thought, and within twenty-four hours he was made to feel his insufficiency in the fulfillment of the words which Christ immediately added, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow, till thou hast denied me thrice. These words Jesus repeated an hour or two afterwards on the hillside. They had a sobering effect on the disciples, an effect which Christ increased by telling them the hour had come for a temporary rupture in the relations that had subsisted between them for three years and a half. When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? They answered, No. Their every want had been liberally supplied by those among whom they had labored in his name as he had told them. But now, says he, he that hath a purse, let him take it, 
and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Why? He supplies the answer in these words. For I say unto you, This that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. The disciples took him literally. They had two swords among them. They produced them. Lord, here are two swords. In his own mental agony, and in their obtuseness of understanding, he did not enter upon explanations. He simply waved the subject into the vague response, It is enough. That he did not mean they were literally to buy and use swords was shown at the moment of his arrest, when Peter, having drawn one of the two swords in question, upon the servant of the high priest, Jesus said, Put up now thy sword into his sheath, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. What did he mean then? He meant that for a time the divine protection that had guarded them all in their mutual labors was to be withdrawn, in consequence of which he, the shepherd, would be smitten, and they, the sheep, would be scattered, as it was written. The violence of the enemy would prevail in his destruction, and for the moment he would be in the category of captured felons than which there is no lower point of degradation and helplessness. His recommendation of self-help in the various particulars enumerated was his figurative way of describing the dark hour that was about to set in upon them. The disciples began now to be seriously troubled. They had for some time resisted the doleful tendency of Christ's communications to them during this most sad Passover. Their conviction that the kingdom was nigh enabled them to bear up against it, but now they began to see that something of a really terrible nature was looming, and their hearts sank within them, sank more than the facts warranted, sank farther than Christ intended, sank as if there was to be no rallying from the trouble, as if the approaching success of the enemies of Christ meant the complete failure of Christ's messiahship, the complete extinction of all their hopes. After a due pause, therefore, Jesus altered the tone of his remarks, forbidding them to be downcast, and reminding them of the brightness that lay beyond. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Believing in God was a matter of course with a Jew, Believing in Jesus was not so, because he was a recent object of faith, and as yet, but very imperfectly understood, besides being opposed by the recognized authorities of the nation. To believe in Christ was therefore a needful subject of exhortation, and it was what we might call a natural source of consolation. Belief in God did not necessarily bring consolation. It might bring the reverse— for the whole history of Israel had shown him the adversary of the nation because of their disobedience. The Jews were still disobedient, and therefore belief in God was calculated to inspire fear. But belief in the Messiah was a source of hope and comfort, because the Messiah's mission was to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. Before he closed his remarks, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you in parables. A more beautiful and comforting parable of the kingdom of God he could not have spoken, than by comparing it to the house of his father. What more endearing than my father? What more safe and beautiful than his house? What could bring a greater sense of loving security and peace? This was the view Jesus presented, that their hearts might be cured of trouble. And actually, the grievous things he had told them of were part of the process 
by which he was going to prepare a place for them in that house. There were many mansions therein, many abiding places, places of fixed and permanent and honorable abode, but as yet they were unoccupied and could not become tenanted without preparation in harmony with the laws of the house. To accomplish that preparation, he must be separated from them. He must die. He must rise. He must depart to heaven as their high priest. But when the work was done, he would return and receive them, and they would never more be parted. Whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. He had informed them on the subject from time to time, but not as yet with much effect of enlightenment. Thomas confessed their ignorance. Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus, disappointed but patient, renewed his previous instruction, but this time in a condensed and somewhat parabolic form. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The disciples' ideas were as yet too much on the outside of things. They were thinking of mere geography when Christ talked of going and preparing a place, whereas Christ was speaking of the legal and spiritual relations between God and man, which had all been marred and deranged by sin, resulting in every form of evil upon the earth, and which were to be set right in him by death and resurrection as the nucleus for a new development of Adam's race, the foundation for a new house to be built up in the earth of new and living stones for the habitation of God and the joy of men. His discourse centered in himself in what was to be accomplished by him and in him, the opening of the way, the manifestation of the truth, and the bestowal of the life. There is no way apart from him. Grievously mistaken are those who think there is a way in Confucius, in Brahma, in Zoroaster, or in whatever sincere idea or endeavor men may formulate for themselves. As for the truth, men of a certain stamp much ask, what is the truth in relation to human destiny or man's duty or man's relation to God? Such questions, in whatever form, are all answered in the single word, Christ. Away from him, it is not only all speculation, but falsehood. The plausible talk about what is truth to one, being not truth to another, will be found at last to be mere aberration. Truth is absolute and inflexible, like the laws of nature. It has been revealed that truth for man as regards duty and futurity is embodied in Christ. Men will seek in vain to draw water from other fountains. Life. There is none without him, speaking of man and of the ultimate shape of things on the earth. Man is mortal. The life he has vanishes at last like the moisture of the plucked flower and leaves him withered and dead. The idea that his life is he is the fiction of an obsolete philosophy. He is an organism whose basis is in the materials of the globe. When the life has evaporated from the organism, the organism quickly decomposes and disappears, and man is gone. Where is there renewal of life for him? Nowhere in all creation, but in Christ. He is the way the truth, and the life. There is no access to the Father but by Him. All attempts and expectations apart from Him are the vain imaginations of man. How came a son of Mary to attain such a vaulting preeminence? How came such superhuman things to be affirmable of a man? Of such a man as the disciples as yet imagined him to be, they never could have been affirmable. Such a man he was not. 
but the veiled manifestation of the Father himself. This he proceeds to declare. If ye had known me, ye would have known my Father also. They had known him in a superficial way, but not in his real relation to the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew that he was Christ in the traditional sense of the Jewish expectation, without knowing what this truly involved. Had they known him in his reality, they would have discerned the presence of God in their midst. This he proceeds to say, From henceforth ye know him, and have seen him, the Father. Still, the disciples did not apprehend him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus now spoke plainly, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? This declaration probably staggered the disciples, as Christ's next words took the shape of interrogative appeal to previous convictions. It would not have staggered them had their enlightenment been complete. For many generations, the scriptures had revealed to them that the Creator not only dwelt in heaven, his dwelling place, at inconceivable distance from the earth, but filled all space by his Spirit as a unit of diffused presence and power, so that he could say, Do not I fill heaven and earth? Their history had familiarized them with the idea of this, the one omnipresent God of their fathers, manifesting himself by concentration at a point or in a person, as when he spoke in the prophets or worked by an angel. It ought not, therefore, to have been difficult for them to receive the idea of the Father connecting himself with the seed of David and dwelling among them in the person of a son. But the things of the Spirit are high and subtle and great, and it is a while before the weak human mind rises to them. Jesus knew the weakness and the willingness of the disciples, and he was patient. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, in the shadow of his hand he hath hid me, and the Father in me, or else the disciples still showing non-receptivity, believe me for the very work's sake. That is, if the Father be not in me, how do you account for the works which you have seen me perform? Strengthening the argument with a view to their conviction, he spoke of their own coming participation in the power he had manifested, predicable, however, on their recognition of his relation to the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works shall he do, because I go to my Father. Christ's departure to the Father would give him greater power of imparting gift than he could possess while in the fixed groove of his work in the flesh. If he remained with them, it would not be in his power to do for them what he could do if he went to the Father. It was therefore expedient for them, as he afterwards told them, that he should go away. He should then be able to do for them whatsoever they should ask in his name. Why this should be so, why he should have more power to bless them separated from them than with them, we need not ask, though we may discern a glimmer of the reason in the fact that while with them he was in the feeble nature common to them all, with power limited to his mission in the flesh, while after death, resurrection, and ascension, he would be harmonized and assimilated and absorbed, as we might say, in the Father power of the universe, and have all power in heaven and earth, as he said. Referring to that time, he says, If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. To ask anything in his name, 
is not only to ask it for his sake, in that union with his name which the reception of the truth imparts, but with eye and heart fully open to him in the invocation. Hence love and obedience would be the conditions precedent of his attention to such petitions, which he indicates in the words immediately added, otherwise apparently without connection. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That is, the comforter would not depart as he, Jesus, was about to do, even the spirit of truth, not the disposition of truthfulness, but the spirit itself, which is the root of all fact and truth, the fountain of all power and reality, as contradistinguished from the impotencies and imaginations of human wisdom, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, nor knoweth him. The natural man is responsive only to that which he can experience in the ordinary range of his faculties. The Spirit of God is not within this range at all. Consequently, it is to him a myth or a notion, though in reality the first and truest and most powerful of all truth. For by the Spirit of God all things were made and subsist, and by it greater things will yet be done in the evolution of God's purpose in the original constitution of things. But ye, my disciples, know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. They had seen the Spirit's work in two forms, in the ministry of Moses and the prophets, in all the generations of their forefathers, and in the works of John the Baptist and of Jesus before their own eyes. Seeing, they believed, and received the Spirit's testimony and command. Thus they knew the Spirit of truth, and thus he dwelt with them. But a closer intimacy was coming, for which Jesus would prepare the way. He shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. Hence he calls the Spirit the Comforter. The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. They were in fact to become spirit-guided men when he should leave them. While he was with them, they were Christ-guided men, which was a great privilege, but spirit-guidance was greater. Christ-guidance in the days of his flesh was guidance from without, while spirit-guidance would be guidance from within, a guidance unerring and permanent. At that day, Ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He refers again to his approaching departure, but in a vein more comforting than his first illusion. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Christ had been a familiar figure in the world, for three and a half years, and as regards the Nazareth world, thirty-three and a half years. But he would be seen among them no more, for within the next twenty-four hours they would crucify him and bury him and think themselves done with him. But he would rise, and the disciples would see him again, though the world would not. And because he would live again to die no more, so ultimately would it be with the disciples. They also would rise from the dead and be glorified and immortalized in nature, and this because of the power and authority resident in the risen Christ. At that day they shall know what he could but testify while he was with them, always presuming the continuance of their love, for what is life without love? and the love he would require at their hands must be of the robust and practical kind that found expression in action. What is love without kindness? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, 
He it is that loveth me. Such love will not go unrequited, though for a time it may seem spent in the air. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Why is this manifestation so guarded? Why not open and indiscriminate so that all the world could see and believe? So the skeptic asks. So Judas, not as Cariot, asked, but not in the spirit of skepticism. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not to the world? Jesus answers in a way requiring search for his meaning. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These facts, thus stated abstractly, supply the reason why there was to be no manifestation to the world. In brief, they were not fit for it. As Jesus had before said, they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. There can be no divine condescensions in a personal form in the absence of loving obedience. This was entirely absent from the world referred to. They neither received Christ nor kept his word. And how was it possible there could be any further manifestation towards them, seeing the words they had rejected were not those of Christ the man considered in himself, but of God who had made all things? God is great and will not be mocked. I will be sanctified, honored, had in reverence, in them that approach unto me, said he to Moses, when Nadab and Abihu were struck dead for trifling with his appointments. Adam was driven out of Eden for the same reason, and could there be any divine confidences extended to a generation so inappreciative and rebellious as that which had rejected God himself in rejecting his son? No, Judas, not Iscariot. The only thing remaining was the apostolic preaching of the gospel for a testimony against them, and then judgment and fiery indignation, such as nearly destroyed Israel out of the earth. But as regards believers, the purpose was peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Well might he add, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Great peace have those who receive the peace that Christ gives. The world cannot give peace. It may bestow its favor, its commendations, its emoluments, but these cannot bring peace. They may afford gratification to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, but they cannot minister to those higher capacities and higher cravings in eloistic man, which can only be filled and satisfied by God himself. Man was made for God in the beginning, and can never realize the object of his being away from his friendship and service. These, secured in Christ, give peace. A peace that makes a man independent of the world, a peace too profound to be described, fitly defined only in the words of Paul, the peace of God that passeth all understanding, filling the heart and mind. It is a peace accessible in Christ only. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a peace that can endure and improve of Christ's own absence for a time in view of the objects involved, as he proceeded to say, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, that is, truly loved me in the enlightened way that they thought they did, but which they did not, till their understandings were afterwards fully opened, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. He now explained that he had told them beforehand of his coming departure, 
that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. This may sound strange, but we must remember that the faith of the disciples was not at this time finally established, because not yet standing upon the broad foundation of a full understanding. They knew not yet that the work of Christ required his submission to death as a sacrifice for sin, and the occurrence of that event, now impending, was calculated to strain, and did in fact terribly strain the faith founded merely upon his miracles and the gospel of the kingdom. It would help them to survive the strain when they came to look back and remembered that he had spoken to them plainly of his separation from them as a necessity. Then remembered they, as we read in one case, that he had spoken these things unto them. His remarks at the table were coming to a close. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, that is, to take me. The prince of this world was a periphrasis for the authority or government of the present world as represented by Pilate, the Roman governor, and Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest. Arrangements were about complete at that moment for his arrest. The band of soldiers and officers under Judas's leadership was being organized. He hath nothing in me. That is, there was no cause of arrest, no fault in this man, as Pilate, on investigation, testified. Why then did it happen? There were reasons, connected with divine law, though not with human law, that the world may know, as it will ultimately know and recognize, that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, that I should lay down my life, even so I do. Chapter 53 On the Way to Gethsemane When Jesus had finished the remarks considered in the last chapter, he said, Arise, let us go hence. Upon this they sang in hymn, and went out unto the Mount of Olives. On the way, he appears to have referred again to the calamity overhanging them all. There was something extremely natural in this. We all know from experience how the agony of approaching evil recurs again and again to the troubled apprehensions. This agony must have been peculiarly acute in the case of the Lord, from his knowledge of the certainty of its occurrence and from the extreme susceptibility to impression which must have characterized so lucid a mentality as his. His illusion, however, was not in the vein of tragedy, or even in the spirit of suffering, but rather in that of the calm and dignified contemplation of fact. All ye, said he, as they walked along, shall be offended because of me this night. Stumbled is the idea, confounded, perplexed, their minds were fixed on him in his kingly capacity. Something was about to happen for which they were totally unprepared, though he had sought to prepare them. The prophecy was to be fulfilled, which said, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Though God should be the smiter, it would be by the hands of the ungodly and the cruel. The tender, loving, faithful shepherd should be delivered into the hands of sinners, who should insult him and kill him. Yet would the cloud be but for a moment. After I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter again protested the impossibility of his deserting the Lord, whatever others might do. Again, he received the intimation that Peter would be distinguished above the others in denying. Again with ardor, he declared his readiness to go with him to death, in which the other disciples joined him. With this, the affectionate tussle closed, and the subject changed. The vine was a common thing in Palestine, and must have been a common object on the road which Jesus and his disciples now walked towards the Olivet suburb of Jerusalem, which, though naked enough now, 
was richly cultivated before the terrible Roman destruction. Apparently seizing on this common, familiar object, he made it a text for most interesting discourse concerning himself. Considering the painful preoccupation of his mind, we may realize the mental majesty that could so speak on the way to agony and death. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. What a glimpse we get here of the vital position of Christ in the Father's work and purpose on the earth, a position so ignored in the popular and learned thoughts of the day, the Father cultivating and training the Christ vine for the rich grapefruit of his service and praise. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Here we have men in Christ, the Father's tillage. But the tillage is with an object, not the mere benefit of the branches, as the popular idea of salvation supposes, but the gratification and profit of the Father vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. A fruitless branch, a useless thing. What is the fruit? The results that spring in a man's mind and life from the faith of Christ, otherwise described by Paul as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God aims at producing this fruit in men by the truth concerning Christ. The power or success of the truth in any man is to be measured by this result. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. If the fruit does not come, the Father removes the branch. So Jesus informs us. This will be done finally at the judgment, but there is many a removal in the ways of providence now, as we learn from the messages of Christ to the seven Asiatic churches. If the fruit comes, what then? The fruit-bearing branches, instead of being removed, become the subjects of special attention with a view to their further improvement. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth or pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The true and loving servants of Christ may therefore expect trouble. Trouble not allowed to go to the destroying point, is the thing for accentuating a man's spiritual preferences. Hence it is love and not displeasure that leads the father to bring his children into trouble. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them who are exercised thereby. The trouble, however, will not be prolonged beyond the time it is needed. The God of all grace, after ye have suffered a while, will establish, strengthen, settle you. Jesus proceeded to indicate the principle on which men become engrafted in him as branches of the vine. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. This is the principle to which every study of the word of God conducts us. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word which Christ spoke, and the word contained in the scriptures of Moses and the prophets, is one. 
it is increasingly unfashionable to estimate that word in the way Christ indicates. But the truth remains with Christ, though all the world go away from it. It is by the enlightenment resulting from the study of the Christ word given to us in the scriptures of truth, and by this enlightenment alone, that men can attain that unity with Christ which is signified by incorporation with the branchship of the true vine. And it is only by continuance in this enlightenment that the connection can be maintained. Therefore, saith he, abide in me, and I in you. This implies the need for effort on our part. We cannot abide in Christ, nor he in us, without aiming to do so. Practically, it means letting the truth abide. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, or, as Christ expressed it, let my words abide in you. How we are to do this is manifest, but has been much obscured by the metaphysical theology of the Dark Ages. It is by giving attention to reading. Only by reading the word with regularity, attention, and prayer can the word abide in us. By this process, it does abide. By the neglect of it, it withers away, and the mind is left with its merely natural impressions, which in spiritual directions are darkness itself. There is much literal force and truth in what Christ says on this head, As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a broken branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. There are those who recognize the truth of this, and there are those who practically deny it. The latter give in to the false impression, either that the knowledge of the truth is of little importance, or that once known, it needs no renewal. And under this false impression, they give attention to the truth but little, and cultivate the things of the present world much, with the result that in all spiritual directions they grow barren and sterile. Their hearts become but feebly responsive to the glorious things of God. Their affections die, till at last the withering branch is broken by the next storm and falls with the wreckage to the ground. There is no safety except in Christ's advice to abide in Him and to let His words abide in us. The adoption of this advice brings special privileges. If ye abide in me, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. There are those who doubt, those who deny this. What shall we say? Shall our faith be turned aside by their unbelief? Shall the word of Christ be neutralized by human ignorance and failure? If men of a disobedient and faithless mind ask and receive not, does it follow that God will disregard the prayer of the humble and afflicted who believe in him and serve him? As well might we argue that because God refused to be inquired of by the faithless princes of Israel who came before Ezekiel, therefore to Ezekiel, God would turn a deaf ear? There are doubtless thousands who ask and receive not, because, like these princes, the stumbling block of their iniquity is set up in their hearts. Let not their failures dismay or discourage the humble and the contrite who tremble at Yahweh's word, to whom Yahweh has promised that he will look and save them in their time of need. Let them make their requests known unto God in everything giving thanks, and in everything prepared to subordinate their own ideas and wishes to the perfect will of God. Christ has given us an example here. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, 
but what thou wilt. This qualification makes us certain of an answer to all our prayers, even if we do not get the answer in the very form we may ask it. This is John's reasoning on the point. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. The apparent obscurity of this saying disappears in the experience of true children of God. Such would desire nothing that God sees not fit to give. What he sees fit, that he gives. And this being what we ask, we know that we always have what we ask. And here we rest, even in the midst of the most direful experiences, knowing that experience of evil is part of the instrumentality by which God is preparing children for himself during this transitory age of evil, against the perfect and endless ages beyond. Besides the assurance of prayer answer to those who abide in Christ, there is the assurance out of which that springs, that is, the assurance of Christ's own love. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. It seems a peculiarity about this at first, that continuance in the love of Christ should seem to depend upon ourselves. Does it not depend upon Christ, whether his love continue toward us or not? No. His love is governed by conditions. He explains this. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Is not this reasonable? Is it not beautiful? Here we are, alone in the darkness, with his commandments in our hands. Does it not seem natural that his pity and his love should be excited by the spectacle of poor and feeble men and women striving, under circumstances of difficulty, to do what he has told them to do? And is it not similarly accordant with reason that his love should be turned away from men who are governed only by their natural desires and who do not admit the commandments of Christ to share in the molding of their actions? There can be but one answer. His reason for discoursing of these things is also beautiful. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. What more calculated to kindle and maintain a perpetual personal joy than the confidence that we are objects of care to the Father and that Christ's own love is toward us? We thirst for love and care. We are naturally formed to require and to desire them. And in Christ, they are within our reach in the most perfect and beneficent form. Faith lays hold of them now with perfect satisfaction, with this perfectly consoling prospect, that when faith has finished her short fight during the darkness of this probation, the fact on which faith feeds will become a thing seen with the brightness of the sun. For God himself has said, The hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation toward his enemies. When ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return, and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Here Christ introduced the leading commandment, one that, as Paul afterwards said, comprehends all the others. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. To what length did the love of Christ go? He anticipates the question. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
The world has grown hoary in hatred, strifes, emulations, anger, wrath, and selfishness. To those who know only this bitterness, the very word love has become a mockery. It is a reality for all that, and the most beautiful and powerful reality under the sun. There is no element of character so constraining and ennobling. It is, however, of exotic growth. It can only grow and last where God is known and feared. We love because He loved. It is the principal attribute of the Father's character, for God is love, while much else besides. It is the essential characteristic of His children, for He that loveth not knoweth not God. It is a love that acts more highly and draws its life more deeply than mere like. It acts towards friend and foe, though necessarily more powerfully towards the former than the latter. It can do good to those who hate. It can benefit the unthankful and the evil. It can pray for the scornful and the hurtful. At the lowest, it can and always does refrain from doing evil and inflicting harm on enemies. All this it has been commanded to do, and it finds possible because commanded. But love's glorious revel is towards God, and those who show themselves out of a full heart to be His. It loves God with all the heart, and loving Him that begat, it loveth also all that is begotten of Him. So inevitable is this, that John puts the love of God as the true criterion of the love of his children. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. A man's love of God is a pledge to himself that he loves the children of God, even though he may be as lonely as Noah or Lot and know the children of God only by far-off report. This glorious love is a continual feast. In the nature of things, it cannot come to an end. Faith and hope must necessarily cease with the imperfect order of things to which they belong, but love never faileth. It will rejoice for ever in the perfect objects on which it will feast itself in the general assembly and church of the firstborn, when God will have accomplished His purpose of rooting the wicked out of the earth forever. Jesus recurred again to the fact that our continuance in his friendship is dependent upon conformity to his commandments. That conformity brings us very close to him. It is an honor to have him for Lord and Master, which he says he is, but he points out that we are higher than servants if we make ourselves pleasing to him by the observance of his commandments. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. He would have us recognize that the privilege is of his conferring and in no wise of our own procuring. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. How true is this of the whole work of God? It is an affair of divine initiative. God made choice of Israel. They had nothing to do with choosing him. He forced himself on their notice. His whole work through them, down to that visiting of the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, which is still in force, has been his own planning his own working out. Man has nothing to do with it, except to humbly and gratefully accept what is offered to him. The wisdom of the present world, even in its most approved and most modern form, is darkness on this point. Men have only begun to be wise when they have begun to fear God and to serve Him and wait upon Him in His way. While speaking so much of love, Jesus glances at hatred in the full knowledge that his disciples would have their share. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. 
Herein is an extraordinary theme for contemplation, that the world should hate Christ and his people. About the fact there can be no doubt. The crosses with which the world is filled are the evidences, in a certain way, that Christ the good, Christ the faultless, Christ the perfect, was hated with the intensity that can only find satisfaction in murder. Men who in any degree resemble him have in all ages been the object of a similar feeling. The world cannot find expletives bitter enough to express their contempt and detestation for men who try to keep themselves unspotted from the world and who are animated by the principles and loves that governed Christ. What is the explanation of this apparently incredible but undoubted fact that the best of mankind have been the worst hated. Jesus indicates it in the next remark he made. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. He states it still more plainly in the prayer with which he concluded this loving discourse. I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The explanation of the enmity is clearly seen when we realize what constitutes the godliness of the godly and what constitutes the ungodliness of the ungodly. Taking the ungodly first. God is not in all their thoughts. Gratification is their rule of action, and that on the lowest plane, self-indulgence and mutual glorification for advantage. They worship and serve the creature in one another. They enjoy the things God has made without any reference to God. His worship, His fear, His love, are sentiments totally foreign to them. Their likes and their inclinations are the law of their actions. They are not subject to the laws of God. They look no higher than man in all their dealings and all their relations. They have no hope concerning the future and no intelligence concerning the past. They have no interest in what God has already done and no faith in what he has promised to do. They have no taste for people or books that have affinities in those directions. They are a law unto themselves. They love those that are of their own mind, and this is not with a very strong love. While they hate and hate heartily those who stand apart from them for God's sake and who teach that their worldliness is an evil thing. Nothing is more intolerable and detestable to them than the apostolic injunction, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, unless it be in actual obedience of that injunction on the part of those who love God. By this, their self-esteem is wounded, their pride stung to the quick, their resentments stirred to the deadliest bitterness. They hate godliness, which they call Kent. They detest obedience, which they call hypocrisy. They abominate faithfulness to God, which they call bigotry. The excellence of the excellent is their godliness. Therefore, it was the very excellence of Christ and his brethren that stirred the hatred of the world, and the same cause produces the same effect to this present day. For what is this godliness of the godly but the reverse of ungodliness on every point? With the godly, God is first. His law is their rule, whatever self-mortification it may inflict. Gratification is with them permissible only where the law of God allows. The worship and service of God is their highest pleasure. His love, their highest affection. They set God always before them. Man is interesting and valuable to them as he conforms to God. Glory to God in the highest is their motto. Their whole interest is in His purpose with the earth. 
Their hearts are in what He has done and what He has promised to do. Their minds are shaped and controlled by His commandments. It is no wonder the world cannot love them, and no wonder that their part is to come out from among them. How can two such opposites mix? It is a bad sign when the professed friends of Christ are at home in the world. There must, of course, be intercourse and adaptation to a certain extent, as Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But between true men of God and thorough paced children of the flesh, there can be nothing in common as regards principle of action and policy of life. He who is after the flesh hates him who is after the Spirit, if he be really such. It is by no means pleasant to the friends of Christ to be objects of hatred. It is an experience, however, to which Christ's example and Christ's words have reconciled them. Properly enlightened, they do not look for anything else. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you, because they know not him that sent me. When therefore a man of God finds himself avoided and tabooed and disliked on account of his partiality for the things that pertain to God, he is not tempted to conceal his partiality or to conform to the world to disarm their enmity. He rather accepts the situation with a certain satisfaction. He finds consolation in the fact that Christ experienced an exactly similar treatment, and that the real explanation of it is that the world, with all its pretensions to superiority, is ignorant of the highest and the governing fact of the universe, namely, that God exists and has made all things for himself. They know not the Father. This is enough to reconcile us to their unfriendliness, or at all events, to enable us to bear it with composure and to choose it by preference. For what wise man of God would want to be on good terms with a generation that, in works, deny him? What enlightened man would wish to be in love with those who hate Christ? and that they hate him is shown by their utter disregard for all things pertaining to him, and by their disobedience of his commandments. He that hateth me, Christ proceedeth to say, hateth my father also. The world hates God. This is the true explanation of its hatred of all who belong to him. There is a terrible sequel to its awful infatuation. A sword is sharpened and furbished. It glitters for the slaughter. If Christ had not come and done works unparalleled in the history of mankind, their indifference might have been excusable. So Christ proceeds to say, But after the display of wisdom and power that took place in the apostolic age, and which has practically been held up to the gaze of all subsequent generations in the apostolic writings, there is no palliation for the universal folly and stupidity. They have truly hated Christ without a cause, and their crime will be brought home to them in terrifying judgment when once his wrath begins to burn. Chapter 54 Nearing Gethsemane Jesus, continuing his discourse as he walked toward the garden of Gethsemane, referred next in natural order to the provision that was to be made for preserving his work from the oblivion which would certainly have overtaken it if its effect and permanency had been left to the impression made upon his contemporary generation. This was the bestowal of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles as an upholding and working power dwelling and remaining with them, and therefore acting as a comforter. When the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, 
and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. This testifying of the Spirit was essential to the efficacy of the testimony of the apostles. Without it, the declarations of the apostles that a crucified man had come to life again would have been treated as madness, and their work would have been thrown away. But with it, their testimony became a powerful means of producing conviction and faith. The dual nature of the witness was afterwards clearly apparent and distinctly recognized by the apostles themselves. Thus, Peter, in one of the earliest arraignments of the apostles before the Jewish council for preaching the resurrection of Christ, said, We are his witness of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom he hath given to them that obey him. Thus also Paul refers to the matter. Was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nature of the Spirit witness is very manifest. It was by no means the sort of thing that would be understood by such an expression in our age. It was no mere feeling or experience in the minds of the apostles themselves. It was the cooperation of palpable supernatural power shown in the healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, the smiting of the rebellious, the speaking of known languages without learning them, etc. The cooperation of such a divine attestation with the earnest testimony of living eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection was all-powerful with devout multitudes everywhere, producing the faith and obedience which it was expressly given to generate. If such divine endorsement of the gospel is not given now, it is because the extent of the divine purpose as regards the number of believers necessary to fill up the plan does not require it. The scriptures themselves, in the hands of earnest advocacy and honest inquiry, are sufficient for the generation of the remaining number wanted. These things, said Jesus, have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended or stumbled. Why should he provide for the probability of stumbling? Because of the terrible treatment they would experience at the hands of fellow Jews when he should leave them. They shall put you out of the synagogues, equivalent to modern outlawry. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Such experience in the absence of forewarning would have been liable to lead them to think in the bereavement of Christ's absence, that something was wrong, that God had forsaken them, that the work in some inscrutable way had miscarried. His telling them beforehand prevented this. These things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. He had not communicated with them freely on the subject in the early part of their association together. There was no need. These things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. We might imagine the disciples thinking it was a pity he should leave them, since his present was such a protection to them. Jesus took note of the fact that his words were causing sorrow. Because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart but there was a reason for it all. I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. Why the Holy Spirit could not come without his departure, we may not fully understand. Sufficient that Jesus declares such to have been the fact. If I depart, I will send him unto you. His departure and the sending were linked in the Father's methods, and as a matter of fact, the one followed the other within ten days, for when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Jesus having ascended, they were all with one accord in one place, and there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, 
and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus fixes their attention on the work to be done by the Holy Spirit when he should be sent. When he has come, he will reprove or convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. We may see how all this was done by considering what was effected by the cooperation of the Spirit with the apostles after the day of Pentecost. It demonstrated to the entire Jewish community, one, that they had sinned in the rejection of Jesus. Two, that Jesus was righteous, and also the appointed righteousness of God for men, as shown in his being taken by the Father to the Father's own presence. And three, that the present world rulership was God rejected in Christ's acceptance after crucifixion. These things would not be intelligible to the disciples at the first. There were many aspects of the truth as it is in Jesus, which they were, in fact, incapable of discerning, and would not be capable of discerning till they should become the subjects of that illumination and guidance of the Spirit which he promised. Jesus recognized this and found apology for them. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The disciples realized the truth of these sayings, and we are all able to see it in what portions we have of their written epistles. These epistles are luminous with the Spirit's presence, and rich with a wisdom that is not of man. In nothing are they more distinguishable from human writings than in the feature mentioned by Christ. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Human philosophy concerns itself with the how things are done. Divine wisdom deals with the what and the why. Human wisdom would have delighted in a treatise by the Spirit on its own nature, its molecular constitution, if it have one, and the number and mode and origin of the vibrations by which it accomplishes the various results achieved by it as the medium of creative will. Divine wisdom passes by these speculative and useless abstractions and presents to our attention the earnest and valuable lessons of truth as affecting our present peace and our future well-being. The Spirit spoke not to the apostles of itself, in the sense dear to the age of Greek philosophy, but spoke of the things it was charged to communicate concerning Christ and the future. In this lay wisdom. What benefit would there have been in discoursing to us of matters we could not understand, and that could not interest us? It would be as if the electric telegraph, instead of bringing us messages of intelligence and friendship, were to occupy our attention in vain disquisition on the nature of electric force, which no man can understand, whatever terms of explanation might be employed. No, the function of the Spirit was practical. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Spirit with the Apostles was not a philosophizer about Spirit, but a simple medium of instruction transmitted from the Father and the Son, instruction with a practical object towards those instructed. This instruction related to the things concerning Christ and therefore the Father. For as Jesus immediately added, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. This close co-partnership between Jesus and the Father is at the root of the gospel which the apostles were to preach. It is the most fundamental element of the truth. 
Christ is not truly discerned, where he is not seen as the expression, manifestation, instrument, and presence of the Father among men for their salvation, on the principle of his own supremacy as the basis of his kindness and forgiveness. He is not seen scripturally, if seen as a man merely, however noble. He was a man, but more. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The ascriptions of the glorified saints, as heard by John in vision, are equally to him that sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Jesus keeps this wonderful truth in view all through this discourse. He recurs to it again and again. But here he diverges a little. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. The disciples could not understand this in their ignorance of the impending separation. The two little whiles puzzled them. We need be in no such difficulty. Its meaning is plain from the history of the case, in connection with the commentary on the case which Christ added in response to their manifested anxiety to understand. This commentary informed them that, in his absence, the world would rejoice while they would be the subjects of sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Did this refer to the three days' separation about to ensue as he spoke, ending with his resurrection? Or did it refer to the larger separation, ending with his coming again? It seems more naturally to have the larger as its meaning. The two little whiles are then apparent. The first little while. From the moment he was addressing them, to the forty-fourth day afterwards, when he was taken up from them into heaven, when the time commenced and is still current, during which the words are fulfilled, ye shall not see me. The second little while, from the forty-fourth day after his crucifixion to the day of his reappearing in power and great glory, when it will be true of all the saints, ye shall see me. If we suppose the words to refer to the short separation to be ended by his resurrection, the facts would be difficult to fit to the words, and the words themselves would have a pettiness of scope quite unusual to the large and exalted style of Christ's utterances. The first little while in that case would be at the most of an hour's duration, for Jesus was apprehended almost immediately after he spoke, and the second little while would consist of the three days he lay in Joseph's tomb, at the end of which he showed himself to his disciples. This limited application would be quite out of keeping with the style of divine language, which calls two thousand years a small moment, and a thousand years one day. Besides, it would fail to provide a suitable place for the two ideas that Jesus associates with the ending of the second little while, the permanent turning of the disciples' sorrow into joy, and the going to the Father as the cause or explanation of their joyful reunion. Although the sorrow caused by the crucifixion was ended by the Lord's resurrection, the disciples, in the larger sense, continued to be men of sorrow long after the Lord's ascension. It could not be said that in that day, the day of his resurrection, the disciples had nothing to ask him, for they did ask him much. Yet Jesus says, In that day ye shall ask me nothing which we can understand as applicable to the day of his second appearing. For then, being changed into the Lord's own nature, even the glorious spirit nature, they will, as Paul expresses it, know even as they are known. When the disciples know even as they are known, they will understand all things with a thoroughness and a translucency that will render the asking of questions unnecessary. Then as regards the words, Because I go to the Father, they could not have a very obvious meaning as applied to the meeting again in Galilee after Christ's resurrection, 
since the departure to the father was after that event, and in no way causatively related to it. But if we understand him to refer to the final seeing him again at his return to the earth at the end of the times of the Gentiles, it is possible to see a logical connection in the statements. His departure to the Father was the procedure on his part that was to prepare the way for a joyful meeting with him again. His intercession as high priest over the house of God was to effect that reconciliation which would lead to joyful reunion after necessary separation. This is the application Jesus gave to the subject in the discourse delivered at the table, considered a chapter or two back. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. On the whole, we seem justified in concluding that Jesus referred to his absence from the earth, still continuing, when he said, Ye shall not see me. If he also meant the shorter separation about to be caused by his death at the time of speaking, it would not be the first instance in which one expression covered two forms of the same truth. It is noticeable that Jesus gives prominence to personal joy as an ingredient of the matter bearing vitally on the disciples now. Your heart shall rejoice, Your joy no man taketh from you. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The modern habit is to deprecate this feature of sentimentalism. This is only one of the symptoms of the false culture that prevails at present upon the earth. Joy is the oil of life. It makes existence sweet and makes men beautiful in each other's eyes. There is little of it at present, because the conditions out of which it springs are violated everywhere, but it remains in the constitution of things as the beneficent possibility all the world over, latent for the time, but ready to spring into activity when its fountains are opened and cleared by the master hand that will make and proclaim all things new in due time, establishing peace on earth and goodwill among men. Meanwhile, It is an individual experience where the mind of Christ prevails, an experience in measure, small measure, but true, joy in God, joy in Christ, joy in the promises and the prospect, and joy in the present path of blessing and well-doing, which on the whole is a pleasant path, though much beset with flesh-tearing bramble growth. As one of the fruits of the Spirit, it is accessible now, but cannot be tasted in its fullness till the day when the redeemed of the Lord shall come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. It is a thing to be cultivated by the children of God as their peculiar privilege, distinguishing them from the gross, heavy-jawed, selfish, joyless children of the flesh. It cannot feed and grow unless the mental roots are fastened in God, who is its eternal reservoir. These things, said Jesus, have I spoken unto you in proverbs or parables. But the time cometh when I will no more speak unto you in parables, but I will show you plainly of the Father. This is an important indication of the veiled character of the statements made by Christ in these discourses. There are some who overlook this character and make the mistake of taking parabolic statements literally, with the result of creating embarrassments for the general adjustments of truth. The subjects on which Christ spoke were such as could not well be expressed otherwise than in parable to men in the mental state of the disciples at that time, or in the mental state of the generality of those who were, afterwards, to read these statements for instruction and enlightenment. What can be more subtle than the relations between creative intelligence as in corporate in the Father, and his operations among men through the Spirit, whether in the ordinary inspiration of his servants, or in the manifestation of his wisdom, character, and power in a body prepared from the seed of David. Figure necessarily enters largely into the expression of these relations when directed to mortal intellect. And of figure, 
there was much in the words of Christ. It would be a mistake to confound figure with literal truth. Yet underneath the figure, there is absolute truth, which Jesus here intimates will one day be made plain. The time cometh when I shall show you plainly of the Father. For such a day every enlightened mind must thirst with ardent desire. Ever since Adam was driven out of Eden, the cherubim and the flaming sword of symbol have shut off the verities of the divine existence from death-stricken man. He has had to discern them as through a glass, darkly. Approach has been invited through them for reconciliation, with a view to the day of open sight that is coming. Those who have accepted the invitation have in all ages been distinguished by a longing for the removal of all barriers and the end of all darkness towards God. They desire to come plainly into the presence and touch of eternal power. Even the higher kinds of unjustified intellect have a certain yearning for the infinite and the absolute. David gives expression to the circumcised form of this longing. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Through Christ, the answer and the solution will come. I shall show you plainly of the Father. What unspeakable satisfaction in the prospect! In no connection are the shortcomings of popular theology more apparent than here. The salvation of sectarian discourse is an affair of getting to heaven to rejoin fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, and all kinds of relations. God is the least desirable object in all their aspirations. Their religion is a religion of the flesh. It is not the faith of Jesus, which tells us the flesh profits nothing, and that no man coming to him is acceptable unless, with the humility of a little child, he discerns and bows before the sovereign preeminence of the Father, of whom, and through whom, and to whom, are all things. Meantime, Jesus gave the disciples this comfort, which belongs to all their class, who are waiting and longing for the manifested presence of creative power and wisdom, namely, that now, in their darkness and loneliness, they are objects of the Father's love. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. What solace is equal to this, to be loved of God? If God be for us, who can be against us? We may take the comfort without reservation if the basis of it is ours. Jesus indicates the basis, because ye have loved me. Men who do not love Christ are outside the comfort of this verse, and if they love him, they will keep his commandments. So Jesus declares, and reason confirms, Though God is love, and loved us while we were yet sinners, yet the personal special love that will redeem from death and plant us in his eternal glory is reserved for those who please him in connection with Christ, who is the way. And first of all, they must love Christ and honor him even as they honor the Father. They are able to do this when they believe that he came out from God. Jesus lays the emphasis of repetition on this point. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. The disciples thought this was plain speaking. So it was in a manner. Still, it was part of the parable in which he spoke. The truth expressed is literal, but requires understanding. 
Jesus literally came out from the Father, but not as a man comes out of a wood. He was not a man before he came, but the Word or Spirit power of God, which became a man in the way described by the angel's words to Mary. Those who think that Joseph was his father are bound to deny this truth and place themselves on the awful reverse side of Christ's comforting words. How can the Father regard otherwise than with displeasure the man who denies that his son Jesus came out from him in any more direct sense than other men who, as Jesus said, are from beneath, while he is from above? The conversation was about over. The disciples thought they saw special light in these last remarks and felt more at ease with themselves. They had believed from the beginning. But there was so much in the sayings of Jesus that was mysterious to them that their ideas had been prevented from settling in a final and comfortable form. Now the clouds seemed to move and the light shine. They expressed their feelings. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. They seemed to expect that Jesus would be pleased with this. So he doubtless was, in a way, but not in the sense of being in any way indebted to their patronage. They did not see so clearly as they thought. Events showed it. So Jesus, with apparent brusqueness, thus responded to their expressed fealty. Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, Yea, and is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. With what object did Jesus speak so lengthily to his disciples, then, if he could not accept the incense of their faith and confidence in the complacent spirit in which it was offered? He explained and ended his words. These things I have spoken to you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Chapter 55 The Prayer of John 17 It was night when Jesus discoursed to his disciples on the road in the manner we have been considering. Dark it must have been, but probably not with the darkness to which we are accustomed in the vapor-laden atmosphere of Britain. It would be the darkness of the clear oriental night, tempered perhaps with the starlight which is so brilliant in the east, or even with the moon walking in brightness. There would not be the physical discomfort that attends personal communion in the dark on British roads. At all events, The twelve sad men, as they sauntered leisurely along, would be too absorbed in their communications to take much notice of the physical conditions. Jesus came to a pause with the words, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He then stood still in the midst of the eleven disciples, for Judas was at far other work. In lifting his eyes and assuming the attitude of prayer, he addressed the Father in the words recorded in John 17. What a subject for study! How can mortal man enter into the suspiration of the Son of God directed to the eternal throne? If it be true, as God himself tells us by Isaiah, and as we instinctively feel must be the case, that God's thoughts are as high above ours as the heaven is high above the earth. How can we participate in a communion passing between the man who dwelt in the bosom of the Father and that incomprehensible High and Holy One, whose mind and power embrace and sustain the universe and fill the ages? Yet the placing of the prayer on record is a proof of Christ's desire and design that we should be lifted somewhat in its soaring reach. And truly, this is the effect of its frequent contemplation. 
we cannot appreciate its character at first. But as the mind opens, its greatness dawns. We are struck first with the simple majesty of its diction. There is no redundance of language, no ornamental periphrasis, no effort to amplify or impress, no attempt at style, no tragic emphasis, no grandiloquence of any kind, but the simple utterance of great and powerful thought and fact. It is not a human conception of how the deity ought to be addressed. It manifestly comes from one who made himself equal with God because he said, I am the Son of God. Considering the opening apostrophe, Father, how weighty in its simplicity. This is the approach of more than a mere worshipper. It is the style naturally belonging to one of whom Yahweh could speak as the man that is my fellow. The whole prayer has this undertone of what we might call dignified familiarity combined with reverential subordination. The hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Jesus was not yet glorified. For thirty-three and a half years he had lived the life of a weak mortal man, and that a man of no reputation. Worse, a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. But now his end in this line of things had come, an end darkening in deeper bitterness and distress, yet the end. The cup in his hand was but the prelude to promised joy and glory and honor unspeakable, and for this he prayed, Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Jesus had glorified the Father much during his life upon the earth. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. But when himself glorified, he would be able to glorify the Father with an effectiveness not possible in the days of weakness. He would glorify him in the work to be done through the apostles, when he was exalted on the right hand of power. And he would at last fill the earth with the Father's glory by what he should be able to do at his return to the scene of his labor in power at the appointed time. Having received power over all flesh, he should then give eternal life to as many as the Father had given him. Given, by the process of causing them to know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he had sent. For this knowledge is the way to life eternal. The glory that would enable him to confer this life eternal was the glory of the divine nature transferred to himself. Glorify thou me, with thine own self. The Father is underived life and glory, bodily incorporate in glowing spirit form and substance, dwelling in light unapproachable. To glorify another with his own self is to impart to that other his own nature, which was done when the Lord Jesus was changed into the same image or likeness, so that in Jesus now, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Being thus glorified, Jesus has the power to do for his brethren what has been done to himself, and the promise is that he will do it. He shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his own glorious body, by the energy wherewith he is able to subdue all things to himself. Jesus had his mind set on this attainment, when he prayed this prayer. It was part of the joy set before him, for which he endured the cross, despising the shame. This glory, he says, I had with thee before the world was. It is possible we may fail to enter fully into the thought that was before the mind of Christ in the utterance of these words. Possibly it may blend both the meanings that believers see in it. There is first the sense suggested further on in the prayer, the sense of retrospective prospect, if we might so say, a glory possessed as part of the eternal purpose and plan of things, 
but waiting the future for its actual development as a reality. This seems to be the sense suggested by these words. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, the disciples, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. Here, Jesus makes the disciples actual possessors, so far as apparent meaning of language goes, of the glory of which he speaks of himself as having been actual possessor. We know that in their case, the whole force of the expression lay in the foundation laid for a future manifestation. And he seems to suggest this application in his own case, in the words, For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. That in divine language a man may be loved before he has any existence, we know from Paul's expression in Ephesians and 1 Timothy. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The case of Jeremiah is also very express on this point. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That Jesus himself is spoken of in this sense We have instance in 1 Peter 1, verse 20. He verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. These instances seem to justify the contention that Christ's meaning was that the glory for which he now prays was the glory the Father proposed for him before the beginning of things, the more especially, as we know, that the glory granted to him in answer to his prayer was not a glory that, in the particular form in which it was granted, could have been possessed by him as an actual reality before the world was, that is, the glorification of the mortal body in the Son of God. But this is not necessarily inconsistent with the other view to which Dr. Thomas was always inclined to accord weight and prominence, and which it is impossible to dismiss with a full regard to the grounds on which it rests. It is not necessarily an alternate view, but one that may have a place coordinately with the other. Namely, that Jesus, being what he was, the Word made flesh, the manifestation of the God of David in the seed of David, and therefore David's Lord, it is impossible to disconnect his mentality from the eternal power in which he was rooted, and that although as the son of David and the man Christ Jesus, his existence dates from his conception of the Holy Spirit, the consciousness within him whose foundation was laid by the Holy Spirit may have reflected previous relations in a way that pure earthborns like ourselves have no experience of. The facts stated in the words, I and my Father are one, and The words that I speak are not mine, but the Father's who dwelleth in me, would necessarily carry such an idea and involve a state of mind requiring expressions to describe it that could not be applicable to us. Only on such a principle does it seem possible to attach a natural meaning to the statement he makes in his prayer. They, the disciples, have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. And again, previously, I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go unto the Father. And again, John's remark, Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Jesus knowing that he was come from God, and went to God. Also the expressions, I come down from heaven. Before Abraham was, I am. And his question, What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? All these expressions imply reminiscence of the pre-existing relation of things, which cannot be surprising if we realize that all wisdom and knowledge and memory are stored in the eternal Father Spirit of whom Jesus was the expression. 
It may be there is an ingredient of it in the allusion to the glory had with the Father before the world began. The Father element in Jesus must always be kept in view in judging the expressions that came from his mouth. Jesus then refers to the nature of the work he had done. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. In this, we have a glimpse of the inner side of the work of the gospel, its divine side, its aspect as seen from the standpoint of God and Christ. From this, it is an affair of manifesting God. To man, it may sometimes seem the mere announcement of changes to come, the return of Christ, the immortality of justified man, the setting up of the kingdom. But, rightly apprehended, all these are the manifesting of God. Without God, they could have no occurrence or meaning. It is to carry out His purpose, to enforce His supremacy, that the performances planned and announced in the gospel will be carried out. A reception of the truth, therefore, that limits itself to the skeleton facts of the gospel is an inadequate reception. The truth, as exhibited in the Bible, has God in its sky like the sun, from whose fructifying beams all other forms and things derive life and light. Then we have the whole process of gospel enlightenment in a sentence. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. This comes down to the simplest capacity, and ought to give peace in a distracted theological age. God gave Christ a message to deliver. Christ delivered it. The message has been preserved in writing, and we have but to make its acquaintance and receive it, in order to be in the position of the disciples who surrounded the Lord as he uttered this memorable prayer. We are then included with them in the prayer he prayed on their behalf. I pray for them. Neither pray I for them alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. To be included in Christ's prayer may seem a light and even sentimental matter at present. It will be apparent as a great and solid privilege when the prayer is answered in its final fullness, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This evidently refers to what Paul calls the day of the manifestation of the sons of God. The world will believe when the saints are visibly revealed in the earth in their corporate unity and completeness under Christ at the general assembly and church of the firstborn to whom the wealth and dignity and glory and honor of all the kingdoms of the world will be transferred. The glory of their assembly will be their deathlessness and their absolute unity in mind and nature caused by the brooding and indwelling among them of the one eternal Spirit of Christ, who is the Lord, the Spirit, through whom they will be one with the Father as He was. Such a body of rulers and governors the world has never seen. Strong and glad and beautiful in every faculty, a joy to one another, and a pure blessing to the nations of mankind over whom they will be placed. A perfect satisfaction to Christ, and a praise and a glory to the Father in heaven. The development of such a body was the subject of Christ's prayer. It is a poor view of his words that limits the petition to mental unity among the few and weak disciples at any time living upon the earth during the dark days of probation. Such a unity is doubtless a beautiful thing, but it is never seen to perfection, and never among all, and has never had power to convince an unbelieving world. The unity of an immortal multitude will be a very different thing. It will overawe with its impressiveness and strike conviction into universal man and tend to evoke that glory to God in the highest 
which is the first characteristic of the age of blessing which Jesus came to prepare the way for. Men who do not receive the word which Jesus delivered from the Father are not included in the prayer, and consequently can have no place in the glorious community that will be developed in answer to it, because it is only for those who receive his words that he prays. As regards others, he says, I pray not for the world, but for them whom thou hast given me. These are remarkable and terrible words. If Christ pray not for a man, where is he? As a sinner, he has no standing before God. There can be no approach but by sacrifice and priesthood. This is the lesson of the Mosaic Tabernacle, as well as the express teaching of Christ and the Apostles. It is Christ's appointed part as high priest over the house of God to make intercession for us according to the will of God. Where he refuses to perform this part, there can, in the nature of things, be no hope. Here is Christ refusing to pray for the world, or purposely declaring he omits praying for them, which amounts to the same thing. What is this but the condemnation of the world? On what ground? The cause appears towards the close of the prayer. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. In the beginning of the prayer, Jesus had said, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. If therefore the world know not the Father, as Jesus says, and as we know as the fact, they are not in the position admitting of the operation of his priesthood and the hope of eternal life. The knowledge of God and submission to him are the first conditions of human reconciliation. The destroying judgment attendant upon his coming is alleged by Paul to be directed against them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How far away, then, from the truth as taught by Christ is the theology, as well as the philosophy, of the present day, which obliterates all distinction between the world and his reconciled people. It may seem a narrow view, according to the recognized standards of current human thought, that hope should be limited to those who know God and obey his will as expressed in Christ. But if it is true, what then? The consensus of human opinion will not alter it, and the true wisdom lies in the supposed narrowness. The stars and their movements have always been the same, whatever view has prevailed on the earth on the subject. And so, eternal truth, resting on the appointment of God, will prevail at the last, whatever unanimity of opinion there may be among men to the contrary. Of the men who believed on him, Jesus said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We have in a previous chapter considered why the reception of the word of Christ should be a ground of hatred on the part of the world. That it is so is a matter of universal experience. It might seem to follow that, therefore, the best thing is for believers to withdraw themselves into the seclusion of separate communities, after the manner of the Mormon settlement or nunneries and monasteries, and some more recent American examples. This part of Christ's prayer is a complete discountenance of this conclusion. It would be very pleasing to retire into the harmonious sphere of love and communion, but it would not serve the object for which men and women are called. It is necessary that Christ's people should remain in the world, though not of it, that they may be tried in the tribulation that comes from contact with it. Their separation 
is a separation from the evil that is in it, and not from the forms of life that prevail in it. Faithfulness in this separation is the ground of their final promotion to a state in which there shall neither be adversary nor evil occurrent, and there will be no scope for this faithfulness if they were bodily and socially separated from the world as soon as they receive the truth. They have to endure hardness in obeying the commandments under circumstances of difficulty. The process is painful, but the upshot is unutterably glorious when the short conflict is over. For human life is short, and the welcome seems to come as soon as life has ended, because there is no conscious interval between death and resurrection. We should, however, fail in rightly reading the lesson of Christ's prayer if we did not observe that, while we are to remain in the world during probation, we are not to be of it. It may often be difficult for godly men to reconcile the two things, to remain apart from the world while dealing with it. It is so easy to be drawn insensibly into identity with it while living in it. But there must be a line of demarcation, which it is practicable to recognize and observe. We shall gradually learn this line by the means that Jesus immediately indicated in this connection. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification, or separation from the world, is the result of a mental state engendered by the truth. In brief, the truth is the Bible, and the Bible is the word of God. When Jesus says, Thy word is truth, no doubt he utters what is an abstract proposition taken by itself, as if he had said, Whatever thou sayest is true. But taken in its connection, it can only apply to what is revealed, to the word that has been spoken, as in corporate in the Bible. Where the Bible indwells, in the understanding and love thereof, resulting from, and at the same time, inducing a loving familiarity with its contents, sanctification prevails. It is a sanctifying book by universal experience. Men who keep close to it, with that accompaniment of prayer which naturally springs from it, will not be long in learning where the line lies that separates them from a world lying in wickedness in which they are commanded to live while, with equal exquisiteness, commanded to be separate from it. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves. This presents to us at once the most sublime, and for believers, the most painful fact of the present situation, Christ's departure to the Father, leaving us alone and comfortless in the darkness and storm of the present evil world, while he, anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, basks in the full presence of eternal glory, at whose right hand are pleasures for evermore. We need not trouble ourselves with what may be termed the mechanical bearings of the fact. We cannot apprehend these. We do not know whether Jesus bodily transversed the inconceivable immensities of space to the central throne of eternal light and power, or whether he have but entered the Father's universal presence and become established at the right hand of his power, in the sense of having become assimilated to the Father in the bodily transformation which changed him from flesh to spirit, as seems to be countenanced by the figure of the rent veil, his flesh and also by the fact of his personal appearance to Saul of Tarsus some years after his ascension. The subtleties of spirit relation make possible a blending of both ideas, and make it impossible for us to be confident about the ways of God in such depths. But the fact in its practical bearing is plain, that Jesus, in harmony with the foreshadowing of prayer, departed to the Father, and in doing so, went away from the earth, and remains away till the time appointed for his return.
If we could fully open our minds to the greatness of this idea, we should never know sorrow. We should be sustained by a perpetual sentiment of joy to think that our best friend is closeted, as we might say, with the almighty power of the universe, with whom he is our appointed and all prevailing intercessor, from whom he holds all power in heaven and earth, and by whose arrangement of love. He will come forth to bless us with life and peace forevermore. But we are weak and dim eyed because of the poverty of our nature and the darkness of the situation at present prevailing on the earth. Therefore, we fail to be as glad as we might. But the morning will come, and when the sun rises, the gladsome warmth and brightness of his living rays will chase the darkness and the sadness forever away. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. It was that his disciples might have his joy that he spoke these words, so he says, and such is the effect in measure. We close with the contemplation of these beautiful words Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. This is the end of the matter which will be realized at last. The mortal life of the saints is but a preliminary, a necessary, developing, preparatory preliminary, but only a preliminary, to the lasting relation of things to which they are called by the gospel. The finality, soon reached in reality, for mortal life is short. And at its end, there is no conscious delay in the sequel. The finality is companionship, close, loving, and delightful, with Christ, in the glory that is His forever. The form and locality of this glory, the truth teaches us. Away from the earth, He will not remain. I will come again and receive you to myself. With immortality of nature conferred, The cup of life will mantle to the brim with pure and perfect blessing. To witness and partake of the glory of Christ will be joy unspeakable. The long oppression of evil may crush the very sentiment of joy out of the heart, but this is but for a moment and is a preparation. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory.